Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. The case that we're going to be discussing today is a little bit of an older case, but the family is still looking for answers and I just want to tell her story to make her name known again. Now, this video is going to be shorter than a lot of the videos I post here on my channel because there's simply not a lot of information to go off of. It was very difficult to find any reliable sources whatsoever that told me really any detailed information other than like the general outline of what happened. With cases that have such little information, I typically would wait to see if anything else comes out, but because this case is so old, I just don't think that's going to happen. They did appear recently on the Dr. Phil show about a year ago, um, maybe about a year and a half ago, but other than that, there hasn't really come out with any new information or any real movement in the case, so I'm just going to go ahead and share her story with you today. That's the biggest reason that I want to talk about her story is because no one's talking about her story, and I want people to remember who she is. I want people to hear her name. I know just how desperate her family is for answers, so even though today is going Going to be a little bit of a shorter video. I still wanted to go ahead and share her story just so you can know her name and her story. With that being said, today we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Lori Jean Deppis. Lori Jean Deppis was born on September 17, 1971 and was living in Appleton, Wisconsin at the time of her disappearance. She was described as being a very friendly girl who didn't like to cause any problems and didn't get into any trouble. She was described as having a bubbly personality and was just a a kind soul to everyone she met. She was trusting and kind-natured, which is something that is important and may have even contributed to how her case has happened. Now, other than those very general statements that her family has made, I don't really know much more about Lori, which is just so unfortunate. I don't know anything about what her hobbies were, what she liked to do, where she liked to go, or what her dreams were in life. So because of that, we are just gonna go ahead and jump right into the night that she disappeared. So on August 19th, 1992, 20-year-old Lori had been working at her job at the graffiti store at the Fox River Mall in Grand Chute, Wisconsin. She had a very long shift that day. She had taken her lunch break at around 3 p.m. and then her dinner break at around 6 p.m. By 7 p.m., apparently, she had gone to a different store in the mall and picked up a ring that she had bought for her boyfriend. Then the store closed at 9 p.m. At this point, her and her coworker had to close up shop and that took until about 9.50 p.m. So then at around 9.50 p.m., her and her coworker left the store and she walked through the parking lot to her 1984 Volkswagen Rabbit and started heading over to visit her boyfriend at his apartment. She was last seen heading east on College Avenue as her coworker drove south on US 41. So at the time, Lori was dating a man named Mark Truenbach. So Mark, Lori's best friend, Victoria, and another friend named Lisa, who I think Lisa might have been Mark's sister, but I'm not 100% sure. But either way, they were all waiting for her at Mark's apartment to show up after her shift. A little bit after 10, Mark and the two girls heard a very loud muffler, which they knew belonged to Lori's car, pulling into the apartment complex at 310 West Wilson Avenue in the town of Fox Crossing, which is now renamed to Manasha, and I hope I'm saying that name right. However, Lori did not come up to the apartment when she was expected to. They waited a few minutes before looking outside to see where she was because again, they heard her car pull in. Her car had a very distinct, loud muffler, so they knew for a fact that it was her that pulled in. So first, they just stepped out to the apartment's balcony to see if she was outside, but they did not see her, but they did see her car. It was a very strange scene right from the very beginning, though, because, again, they saw her car, but her passenger door was open, and there was absolutely no sign of Lori anywhere. So immediately, they knew something was off. By 11 p.m. that night, Mark called the police to report Lori as a missing person. When police showed up, it looked as if absolutely nothing in or around Lori's car was out of place. They found a styrofoam cup on the roof of her car, but other than that and the passenger door being open, nothing was out of place. There was absolutely no sign of a struggle. There was no blood. 
there was no sign that anyone else had been in or around her car. No one in the apartment complex had heard anyone scream or saw Lori get out of her car or saw anyone else around her car. The only things that were in her car were her purse and her overnight bag. Police went out and canvassed the surrounding neighborhoods and walked several blocks in every direction to find her, but they found absolutely no sign of her. She was just gone. So after this, police followed up with every lead that they possibly could, but there were absolutely no clues. Her credit cards had never been used again. There was no activity on any phone related to her, and there were absolutely no sightings of her after this. It seemed as if within just a very, very short window of just a few minutes, Lori somehow vanished off of the face of the earth. So from here, much of the investigation has been based around trying to find any possible suspects or even witnesses. So of course, police did look into Lori's boyfriend. Now, years later, when he was on the Dr. Phil show, he said that he felt like they were looking into him way more than they should have. He said that he felt scrutinized, especially by the public. He said that he would walk into different places and they would say, look, that's the guy that, you know, killed his girlfriend. But at least at the beginning of the investigation, and as far as I know, police looked into him very briefly when she disappeared because obviously he was with people that night who could cooperate his alibi. He didn't show any motive. He didn't show any weird behaviors of, you know, someone who would seem suspicious after their significant other went missing, as we so often see in a lot of different cases of a significant other actually harming their partner. He didn't show any of that, and he was very, very, very dedicated to figuring out what happened to her, and he still is to this day. Beyond this, there are only a very few other leads in Lori's case, and they're very shaky. They're not even directly really connected to her case, and they mainly just involve suspects who could possibly be involved. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell you about those now. So believe it or not, I actually could not find any information about the investigation or if they had absolutely any leads or any suspects until 2011, almost 20 years after Lori disappeared. So in 2011, a suspected serial killer named Larry Dwayne Hall confessed to kidnapping and killing Lori and burying her in a remote area in South Central Wisconsin. Now, if you recognize the name, that is because you've probably heard him mentioned in several other cases, including my coverage of the Angela Hammond case. He is thought to be involved in so many different disappearances and murders and kidnappings. So if you guys want a video about him, I can do so. I definitely have seen his name pop up so many times that I have thought about maybe doing a whole video on him and his crimes and his story. So if you do want a video like that, go ahead and let me know down in the comments. But for the sake of sticking to Lori's case and focusing on her, I will just tell you a little bit about him briefly. Larry Dwayne Hall is a suspected serial killer from Indiana who is thought to have done some very, very disgraceful and heinous things to some of his victims. He was actually a Civil War buff, so he would go around to all of these different locations around the country to visit different sites and view the reenactments. He traveled around in his van to different areas, and there have been many victims who have gone missing in these areas that correlate to when he would have been there to travel for the Civil War sites. He was thought to have been active between the years of 1987 and 1994. He is currently serving a life sentence in a federal psychiatric prison in North Carolina on federal kidnapping charges after he kidnapped 15-year-old Jessica Roach. Now, on September 20th, 1993, Jessica was last seen at around 3.30 p.m. riding her bike near her home in Georgetown, Illinois, which is right by the Indiana border. Her body was found a few weeks later in a cornfield near Perrysville, Indiana. Now, Larry Hall had actually never been convicted of her actual murder, just the kidnapping because Investigators were never able to actually pinpoint where she had been killed, so I don't really know exactly why or the logistics of all of it, but he was never able to be convicted. I don't even know if he went to trial for it. They probably just don't have enough information to be confident of getting a conviction, so they're probably still gathering things as he's waiting in prison. 
but he actually did end up confessing to her murder. He gave investigators a written confession, but then he recanted that confession. So even though he's not actually convicted or in jail for any murder, he is suspected of killing up to 40 different women. Now, he has actually confessed to 14 different killings, but there are more that investigators haven't been able to connect him to, and he remains a main suspect in many cases. But again, a lot of these confessions he makes, he recants them or he takes them back or whatever he does. So technically, he's not guilty of any murder by the means of the actual law. So when he confessed to Lori's murder, he told investigators that he would actually go to different mall parking lots, plazas, and stores to scope out his victims. He said that he spotted Lori at a store and then followed her to the apartment parking lot where he said that he chloroformed her and then took her. He said that this is when he took her to a remote location in Wisconsin and then harmed her and then buried her body in a wooded area. In addition to his confession, apparently as police were investigating Jessica Roach's disappearance, they found notes in Larry Hall's van that said Lori, but it was spelled L-O-R-I rather than Lori, L-A-U-R-I-E, which is how she spells her name and a note that said Fox River. So that was something that definitely could have connected to her because even though the name wasn't exactly spelled right, if he just knew her name and speaking, there's no way that he could have actually known how it was spelled. And Fox River is where she was working before she got taken. Investigators had also discovered that he'd actually attended a Civil War reenactment in Kakawana, again, I hope I'm saying that right, in Wisconsin the weekend before Lori disappeared, which is only about 13 miles away from where Lori went missing from. Police have also said that he knows details about Lori's disappearance that have not been made public and are details that only the person who took her could know. However, police have not been able to find any physical evidence that directly connects him to Lori's disappearance. And apparently, I'm not exactly sure why, I think it's some sort of law in Wisconsin, but apparently they have not been able to take him physically out of jail to go ahead and show them where her body is buried. And they had searched the area that Larry Hall had described but they didn't find Lori or any evidence connecting towards her. So the only way to really find out if he knows where she is is to take him there. But again, for whatever reason, they cannot do so. However, Lori's family and friends do not believe that Larry Hall is involved with her disappearance. When he was confessing to other crimes and during his time in jail, he had expressed wanting to take plea deals to give information if that meant that he could avoid the death penalty. That being said, many people believe that the only reason Larry Hall confessed to murdering Lori was so that he could be moved to a prison in a state that does not have the death penalty and Wisconsin does not have the death penalty. Plus, he did recant his confession at some point, so to this day, police really don't have anything solid to connect him to Lori's disappearance. And for now, he's not really considered a suspect, but I do want to say in terms of him recanting, he recanted a lot of different confessions. He seemed to want to just either mess with people by confessing and then recanting, or maybe he really is lying about murdering all these different people. And then, you know, when it's not going the way he wants it to or expected it to, he just recants. So other than Larry Hall, there really is only one other person who could be considered a suspect. And I don't even really know how much police have been able to look into him or if they found anything that connects him to Lori whatsoever other than what I'm about to tell you. So this suspect comes from Victoria, Lori's best friend, who was also at the apartment the night that Lori disappeared. Now, Victoria said that there's this man who had repeatedly asked Lori out and that Lori had repeatedly turned him down. She said that the same guy had asked her out once again the night that she went missing, but again, Lori turned him down saying that she had a boyfriend and that she was not interested. Victoria said that about a week after Lori's disappearance, this man started to show some really strange and erratic behaviors 
at a get together that he had with some of his coworkers and friends. Now, I don't know if Victoria was at this meetup or if she just had a secondhand knowledge, but the way she describes it, it sounds that she was at this meetup. So she said that this man, who by the way, she cannot name because he's not an actual suspect or anything, um, she said that he was drawing and that many of the images that he was drawing were very, very violent. One was a man standing behind a girl with a bloody knife, and another drawing was of a person standing behind a girl and stabbing them. She also added that the girl in these drawings was wearing clothes that was very, very similar to the clothes that Lori was wearing the night that she disappeared. She said that he had drawn a couple other images, but she didn't really remember those ones because the images that were very violent stood out so much to her that to this day, she remembers them perfectly. Again, without revealing his actual name, when she was asked about why police haven't looked into him that much or where he even is in terms of suspects, she basically said that this man had been living off the grid ever since Lori's disappearance and that every single time, as soon as police are able to locate him and figure out where he lives and, you know, they go to try and find him, he finds out somehow that police are after him, apparently, and he leaves before police can get to him. At least that's the way it looks. It just seems that he always leaves as soon as police know where he is. So to me, it sounds like the police know who this man is, but just haven't been able to really track him down and talk to him. So at this point, because they haven't been able to talk to him, they haven't been able to get out any information, they haven't been able to hear his side of the story, so technically there's really not enough information to, you know, take him in or put out a warrant or anything like that. So because of this, he just remains as someone that they would like to talk to, but we don't really have any more information about him or if he really is connected to the case in any other way. Now, I do wish that maybe they had talked to other people at this get-together. I don't know if they had, um, but it would be interesting to see if anyone else has any recollection of this happening other than Victoria, because I feel like that could give them much more reason to actually be able to find this guy and put out a warrant and say, you know, you have to come in and speak to us. But other than that, we don't really know much about any of the suspects in this case, if there even are any, or if there's any evidence linking to anyone or anything. This all just seems to be speculation without any real evidence. Lori's family truly believes that she must have been taken by someone that she knows because that can really be the only thing that explains her being taken away with absolutely no sound, no struggle, absolutely no evidence. She must have gone with someone willingly for that entire scenario to even make any sense. So now I want to briefly go over some of the theories in this case. Now, up until this point, I've kind of spoken about the different suspects that could be involved and, you know, the evidence in this case, despite there not really being any. So we don't really have much to go off of in terms of theory, so that's why I say briefly. But I do want to kind of talk about a few things that could be important to understand in this case. So the first theory, of course, is that Larry Hall really did take and harm Lori in the same way that he described by coming up behind her and chloroforming her. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this theory because even though I do think it could be possible, Lori's family does not believe for it to be true and police are still investigating all of his crimes and putting everything together. So eventually, I think if it does come out that maybe he does have more connection, then we will know that. But for now, it does not seem like a very strong possibility that he could be involved. Honestly, I think the way that he described taking her does not make any sense for the fact that there was absolutely no noise. Now, I will say that it's interesting that her passenger door was open and that the cup was on the roof of her car. To me, that says that she got to the apartment complex and then parked 
and then um, got out of her car and brought her cup to the other side, put it on the roof, and then was leaning into the passenger door to get her overnight bag and her purse so that she could head up to the apartment. So with that being said, I think that when she was taken, the person probably came up behind her as she was leaning into her passenger side door because again that's when she would be unsuspecting she would not be paying attention to her surroundings so if in the larry hall theory if he did take her i think that this is when he would have come up and chloroformed her from behind now i do think it's possible that he did come up and sneak up on her and chloroformed her before she got the chance to scream i will say that as a side note i did have to look up how fast chloroform works so i really hope uh, I don't get, you know, a call from the FBI. Luckily, I was able to use a VPN, so hopefully my FBI agent doesn't get too suspicious of that. Maybe he watches this video and knows that that's why I had to look it up. But from what I was able to find, it seems that chloroform, at least by itself, takes about five minutes of the person inhaling it to actually make them pass out. So I feel like that's just enough time for her to at least start to scream or kick or fight back, even if it's just for a couple seconds or a few minutes. I feel like if someone came up behind her and attacked her in that way, something would have been out of place in the scene. It would not have been so perfect. I feel like maybe the cup would have been knocked over from her kicking the car or her overnight bag would be tipped over or her purse on the floor or just anything would be out of place because I definitely think, again, that if she was taken by surprise and someone tried chloroforming her, I think she would have at least had a second to do something and react. I think at the very least, someone would have heard a struggle or someone start to scream because that's probably your first reaction when someone comes up behind you like that is to just let out a scream. Now, I will say that her friends were waiting for her inside the apartment. I assume it wasn't completely silent or anything, but they heard her and were probably listening for when she came up to the apartment, which again, I know that that sounds like a reach, but just hear me out for one second is that think about it. When you hear your friend coming over or someone coming over and let's say you hear their car honk when they lock their door, you're kind of just naturally listening for them. Okay, they're walking up to the door or they're coming up the stairs to my apartment or whatever. You're kind of just naturally listening for them. And if you don't hear them at all, you kind of start wondering and you wonder where they are, which is exactly what happened with them. So I feel like when they're sort of listening for her to come up, they would have heard some sort of struggle or the scream or her yelling or any sort of noise if there was a struggle. Again, they probably weren't listening super close and they may have been listening to music or something like that. So that's just my thought and my speculation of, you know, me thinking that someone would have heard at least something if there was a struggle, but I don't know, obviously for sure, those are just my thoughts. So the next theory is that she was taken by someone she knew, whether it was the guy who kept asking her out that her friend Victoria knew about, or if it was someone else that no one had suspected. Maybe there were other guys that were interested in her, but they knew she had a boyfriend and never said anything and just sort of waited and then, you know, got frustrated and just decided to take her. We know that that can happen sometimes where it's completely out of nowhere. This guy's stalking her and she has no idea, but you know, maybe she knows him in passing. Maybe he's been a customer a couple of times at work. So, you know, she kind of knows him or maybe he is a friend um, that no one has suspected. Either way, it's possible that someone that she knew took Lori. Now, I do think that in terms of logistics, this makes the most sense. So imagine the same scenario where she gets out of her car and then walks to the other side of her car and goes to grab her stuff. Maybe this person walked up behind her and started talking to her and she was just sort of caught off guard, but not enough to actually make a lot of noise. I feel like if it was someone she knew and they were asking for maybe help with something in their car or, you know, if they're like, I just want to talk for a few minutes, then she would have gone and helped them or been willing to talk to them. Maybe it was the guy who kept asking her out and he said, hey, can I just have, you know, one final time with you talking about this, you know, I just want to hear your reasoning or something like that. And then maybe he got really upset and just decided to take her right then and there. Maybe he had just been frustrated from the very beginning, snuck up behind her and already had the plan to take her. 
Either way, I do think that's possible. Or maybe again, it's someone that she knew in passing. Maybe it was again, a customer at the store and she recognized them and was like, hey, you know, I've seen you around the store or maybe it was a friend or, you know, an old classmate or something. And they were just like, hey, can I talk to you? Or hey, I need help in my car real quick. So she maybe turned around, leaving her stuff and her car door open, expecting to be right back. And then that's when they took her without her making a sound. Again, I think in terms of logistics and the fact that the scene was found so perfectly in place, I think that that's what makes the most sense. If it was a stranger, I could see someone maybe driving up to her and saying, hey, can I have help with this? And then her being a kind enough person to go ahead and help them because her family did say that she was very kind natured and would help someone in need. But at the same time, they said, you know, if it's not someone she knew, she wouldn't just willingly go with them. So again, I know I'm repeating myself, but I think that is why it's most likely that she knew the person and her family agrees that she probably did know this person. I do think that with any of these scenarios, the person probably harmed her right away and then it dumped her body somewhere and just never got caught. The other possibilities I can think of in terms of theories is that maybe it was a stranger who snuck up behind her and took her in a different way than what Larry described, or maybe Larry was just lying about how he took her because I don't think the whole chloroform thing would work, again, with how we found the scene. So it could have been a stranger asking for help or taking her in some other way that got her to come a lot more quietly. But then again, I do think about the fact that this is a very specific apartment complex. It just seems so random and so specific that a stranger would come to that exact apartment complex and would follow her there not knowing, you know, if there's security videos, which I guess it's 1992, so I don't exactly know how common those were, or, you know, if there are going to be friends waiting for her or anything like that. So it just seems very risky. So to me, it seems a lot more like someone who knew her, someone who maybe knew her schedule and knew when she would be out at the graffiti store and followed her from the store, or someone who knew that she was going to be at her boyfriend's house. Maybe this was something she did regularly. I do think that it had to have been someone she knew who either followed her home from the store or waited for her at the apartment complex. But either way, at the end of the day, given how little information we actually know, we have no idea if any of these theories are even close. All we can do is hope that investigators are close to finding out some answers because let me tell you, her family has never stopped looking for her and that is including her boyfriend. He is all grown up and married, and I think he even has kids and everything, but he still tries so hard to figure out what happened to her, and he still speaks about her, and he still so desperately wants to find out what happened to her. He's still fighting for answers alongside her family, so again, I just hope that this video can help spread awareness about a case that has just been forgotten about. Share the face of a woman whose story needs to be told. All I ask is that you share this video or check out the links in my resources and share an article about her or anything. Her family did go on Dr. Phil, like I mentioned earlier, so I highly suggest you go ahead and check that out. Either way, please help me get her story out there and let her family know that people do still care no matter how long it's been since she disappeared. Lori Jean Deppis went missing 28 years ago on August 19, 1992 from Menasha, Wisconsin. She was described as being a white female with brown hair and green eyes, standing at 5 feet 5 inches tall, weighing 115 pounds. She was 20 years old at the time of her disappearance and would be 48 this year. She has a tattoo on her right ankle that looks like a squid. If you have absolutely any information about Lori's disappearance, I urge you to contact the Wisconsin Department of Justice at 920-946-0487. That number, as well as additional numbers and emails that you can contact, will be listed down below. So that is all the information that I have for you guys in today's video, and now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. Do you think that Lori was taken and harmed by Larry Hall? Do you think it was someone she knew, possibly the guy that her friend Victoria was talking about? Or do you think it was something completely different that we haven't even considered? Please let me know in the comments below. You guys always have such good thoughts that I never even thought of. So go ahead and comment your thoughts below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. 
Also, don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions for me, make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.